Bibles, we're going to be starting in Matthew 16, starting in Matthew 16, and then we have a number of passages we're going to look at, and this evening we're continuing. This is the third in a series on four essential freedoms of being Baptist. We started out with, and I think it's the foundation, and that is Bible freedom, and last Sunday night we talked about soul freedom, which some call individual soul liberty, priesthood of the believer. And tonight, we're going to be talking about church freedom, and some would term this the autonomy of the local church. And then in a couple weeks, we'll probably uh, be closer to the July 4th weekend, we're going to do our fourth, and that is religious freedom. And so church freedom, uh, there was a funny story, this, uh, it just has to do with church, all right? But there was a funny story about two uh, children that were walking home after church, and one of the boys turned to uh, the other young man, and he said, you know what, I think I'm going to become a Sunday school teacher when I grow up. I really like the hours. And uh, <laughs> I don't think he talked to the Sunday school teacher about pay, though, all right? But, um, but we're, uh, we're going to be looking at church freedom, all right? So church freedom. And Matthew chapter 16, notice uh, what this is Caesarea Philippi. And we considered a little bit of this. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, yes, we use this for soul freedom. Remember, uh, Christ uh, asked, whom do men say that I am? And they were talking about different people. And then he said, but whom say ye that I am? And that showed individuality. But then he continued on. And look at verse 18, because uh, Peter says, thou art the Christ. And in verse 18, it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ is invested into this concept of church. All right? He's very very interested in it. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, we find that Christ shed his blood. For the church. Yes, he shed his blood for the souls of men, but he shed it for the church. And so that's why we consider the church very important and the freedom that we have. Uh, If you turn to the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, you see another passage about church here. It says in Acts 13 and verse 1, now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, separate, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So the reason I'm reading this is it's talking about one church. It's not talking about a bunch of them. It's talking about one church. It's very important that we see that, that it is a church. Romans uh, chapter 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. And then later in verse 7, so he says, and this is Paul, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that this is the epistle to the church at Rome. Uh, Then we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, the will of God, Sosthenes, our brother, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So we believe that this letter was written to the church at Corinth. The same can be introduced to Galatians, the church at Galatia, then Ephesus, the church, that's the book of Ephesians, then Philippi, then Thessalonica, all right? And then go to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2. We know this is the seven letters to the churches of Asia, all right, or a letter to the seven churches of Asia. And notice in verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Okay, so that's written to them. Uh, then we go to uh, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Okay, so we see that he writes to Pergamos in verse 18, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira. 
So the angel, most uh, believe that the angel is a representation of the pastor. So he's writing to the pastor who heads up a church in Ephesus and Pergamos and Thyatira. Uh, you can go in chapter 3 at Sardis. Um, we go through all of these, and these are individual churches. And they have a pastor that leads that church. And so these things are written to them specifically. This, this is one of the foundational ideas of church freedom. So tonight we're going to quickly look at it. I don't think it's too complicated. I think most of us understand it. But we're going to look at this idea of church freedom. And I only have three points. They're pretty easy. First of all, church freedom defined. What do we mean by church freedom? Churches are free under the lordship of Christ to determine membership and leadership to order worship and the work of their ministries. So we're saying, and we call this the autonomy of the local church. All right, that's defined. It's saying that a church individually has the right to do this. All right, that's why I just presented, and you're going to see some of the aspects of the church. Uh, we're in motion right now. All right, uh, this evening you're going to see an ordinance. There's two ordinances that we believe are uh, given to the church, the church, individually. And so a church baptizes, a church celebrates the Lord's Supper. That's what we do as a church. All right, now there are some, I don't, I don't, I don't get into the, there are some that think there's another ordinance, foot washing. All right, I'm glad that we don't believe in that. We gave that up. Um, I, I believe Christ was the last one that did that, and so I'm glad he, he finished the work. He said it is finished, all right? Um, we a little twi twisted scripture there. Uh, but, uh, but really, we believe in two ordinances. I right? we believe in baptism. You're going to see that uh, done tonight, and, and next week uh, I'm looking at maybe doing the Lord's Supper. And so what are, what are we allowed to do? We're allowed to do those ourselves. I don't have to say, I don't have to um, call up the Pope, like, hey, hey, you know, pyramid dude, all right, big hat man, all right, hey, I'm wondering, all right, and then they'd have to wake him up, all right, actually, it'd probably be an assistant, because probably he's really dead, all right, that was Pope John, all right, we all know, he was dead for years, they just bring him out, all right, bring him back in, all right, and uh, there's a little tape recorder and somebody in the back, and they'd move his mouth, all right. Um, but really, I, we don't have to call down to some place and say, hey, so uh, what do you think? Uh, can we have this this week? No, we're allowed to decide independently. Uh, churches are free under the lordship of Christ to determine membership. Now, Baptists uh, are different, and we fought for this, all right, as far as the autonomy. When we say membership, uh, one of the things that we fought for is baptism, uh, because we don't believe in infant baptism. And, and part of that is because somebody has to be saved to be baptized. So in order, really, biblically, what is membership? And I remember uh, a couple years ago, even in our discipleship classes, I was teaching one group, and I was trying to explain them to Some people think membership has all of these things. Membership, according to Scripture, is saved and baptized. All right, now we have a church covenant, so we, uh, we read that to them. We say, we'd like you to agree to this because we covenant together to live godly. And so we believe that somebody that is saved and baptized and saying, hey, I want to live to glorify God. You know what? Yeah, that's, that's what we want in membership. Uh, we don't have the, this list of all kinds of extra. Well, also if you give this amount of money, and also if you do this, and also if you do that. Really, it's saved, baptized, and with your life you're saying, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. agree to that covenant. I want to glorify God. That's what we agree. Churches are free under the lordship of Christ to determine these things. Uh, we're, uh, churches are free. We don't have to ask another church as far as voting somebody in. We don't have to, now, uh, there is, if somebody comes uh, from another church, another church of like faith, there's a courtesy that uh, really good churches will do is I'll call that pastor and I'll say, hey, if they come from a church of like faith, I'm going to call that pastor. 
and I'm going to ask him and say, hey, so did you kick them out? All right, are they, um, uh, do they have a warrant out for their arrest? All right, that's, that's a good thing to do because uh, churches of like faith uh, should, what, what, what is the goal of a church? It's to, it's to have a membership that is glorifying God. Well, if, they're, if they were voted out of a church because of sin and they're running to your church and you're just like, oh, I, hey, you know what? Um, <laughs> don't ask, don't tell, all right? Um, that's not a good policy, all right? We're, we're going to try to find out. Why? Because we want a membership that glorifies God. So church freedom, that's defined. Secondly, church freedom explained. I got two points underneath that. First, the autonomy of Baptist churches. All right, what does, what does autonomy or autonomous mean? Autonomous comes from two Greek words, self and law. Autonomous then means self-governing or self-directing. Thus, an autonomous church governs itself without outside human direction or control. Now, it's not absolutely autonomous because a church should always recognize the control and authority of Jesus Christ as their Lord. He is the chief shepherd. So every Baptist church is autonomous. Being autonomous as a church is a it's a large part of what it means to be just the word Baptist. All right, when you, when you are a Baptist, that's kind of what you mean. You, you're believing in the autonomy of the local congregation. Uh, Baptists use the term church to refer to a local congregation of baptized believers and not to the Baptist denomination as a whole. Um, there is not the Baptist church. All right, uh, that, that doesn't exist. The Baptist church. Now, you may say, well, we go to the Baptist church. No, there's a bunch of them. Uh, and some people are referring that to the Baptist denomination in general. All right, each local congregation is autonomous or it is self-directing. It has uh, self, uh, it's, it's controlled within themselves. Right? We, don't, we don't have, and that's where, like even, uh, you know, there are some, I guess, conventions through history. Right, right now, the, the biggest, one of the biggest conventions are actually, even in, as they call Protestants in America, probably the biggest organization is the Southern Baptist Convention. The problem that I have with the Southern Baptist Convention is it goes a lot against this idea of autonomy and the word Baptist. They should just be called the Southern Convention. All right, that would be really good. Just be the Southern Convention. Because the idea of the Southern Baptists, what they wanted is maybe some of it wasn't bad at first. Hey, we'll be able to help our pastors out maybe with a pension fund. We'll be able to help them with uh, owning and be able to buy some property. We'll be able to organize a little better and be able to send more missionaries out. You know, maybe at first that wasn't a bad idea, but guess what happens? If, if it gets away from scriptural ties, which that's what's happened, the guy that heads up the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, J.D. Greer, is a horrible liberal. All right, read some of the things that he puts out. I mean, he's, he's horribly liberal as far as taking over. Uh, he's, he, he doesn't, uh, he's, not a, he's not a strong biblicist. He may consider himself, but he's not a strong biblicist. Uh, even within the ranks of the Southern Baptists, there's all kinds of fractions and divisions and all kinds of things that are going out. Part of it is because they have a hierarchy. That's not what Baptists are about. Baptists don't have a hierarchy. Every church is its own. All right, we, we kind of joke about that, okay, because all right, there, are other, there are other schools, all right, for instance, I, uh, we, have, we have a few graduates from Bob Jones. Bob Jones is not Baptist. All right, Bob Jones isn't Baptist. <laughs> it hurts, doesn't it? All right, they were, they were Methodists. Now, there was a lot more, there was a lot more, I would say, connection or a, a lot more a similar relationship between some of these schools way back 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, there's a lot more, I would say, cooperation. But Bob Jones was Methodist. 
right? And Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Pentecostal, some of these others uh, that are out there, they're not Baptist in their thinking. So what does that mean? All right, they, all right, uh, we always joke about this because very even Baptist graduates basically have no loyalty to us. None. Whatsoever. They're like, hey, we're independent. I'm like, hey, yeah, could, but you, could you like, like us once? I right, just one thing. All right, but part of that, that's being Baptist. All right, and we talked about that as the soul freedom. Some people take it extreme. Some people, basically, anything you say, I, um, some Baptists are liberal Baptists. What it means is they would fit well being anti-Trumpers, right? because anything he says, they're against. They're contrarians. Right? There are many uh, Fairhaven alumni that are exactly that. Anything we say, like, no, nope, don't like it. Like, whoa, whoa, I mean, whoa, whoa, what's wrong? Uh, don't like it. Right? There's an automatic contrarianism. Right? Anything, anything, any, anything that uh, this guy does, I don't like it. Well, I mean, is there like a Bible reading? I don't care. I don't like it. Well, when it comes to the autonomy of Baptist Church, we were, we were talking a little bit about Bob Jones. Well, they, all right, so many of their guys, in fact, I know of, I know of guys, my son, pastor, pastors that I know of that were basically, they were blackballed by Bob Jones, which you're like, well, actually, I don't think you can do that. Right, but guess what? Bob Jones isn't Baptist. That's, that's what a hierarchy does. A hierarchy excommunicates. They blackball. They do whatever. All right? and they, because they, they have this power. And that's what we don't believe in. As independent Baptists, we believe in the autonomy of the local church. We believe in the autonomy of of each individual con congregation. And so when it comes to this, being autonomous, a Baptist church recognizes no governmental control over faith and religious practice, none. Although Baptist churches obey the laws of governments related to certain matters, they refuse to recognize the authority of governments and matters of doctrine, polity, and ministry. Now, where do, we, where do we see that? Even in Matthew 22, this is what Jesus says. Jesus said this to the Pharisees. Remember when they came to him and they held up a coin? He said, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render unto God the things that are God's. You know what we believe is God's? The church. Christ said, it's mine, my church. So guess what, government? Get out. Get out. You don't belong in the church. Why? Now, Listen, Methodist, all right, Lutherans, even Martin, Martin Luther at one time wrote a thing because he almost believed this, almost, all right? And then he went around and killed a bunch of Baptists, all right? And there was a bunch of them, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, all right? They don't necessarily have a problem with state-run churches. They don't. That's, that, that's kind of in their heritage, but Baptists have always fought, and you see this in history, especially in Baptist history. Uh, Baptists always have kind of have been the, uh, the off-scouring. Right? When you follow the Baptist line, they've kind of been the off-scouring uh, of religions. But what's interesting, in America, Baptists kind of all of a sudden, all right, and that's what I think God has, God has brought some of this in even for us that's going on in our country. But guess think, Baptists in America, we've had it pretty good. Some of the biggest churches all in America have been Baptist churches. Some of the biggest named preachers and evangelists have been Baptist in the last 50 years, 70, 70 years, 75 years. And I think some of it is we got a little too big for our britches because it's his church and it's about him. It's not about our buildings. It's not about our name. It's not about our recognition. It's about his kingdom and not our kingdom. And we need to be careful about this. Baptists have consistently rejected the efforts of any secular government entity to dictate to a church what to believe, how to worship, or who should or should not be members. Again, that is not... That is not um, true of other, some other mainline denominations or religions. 
Uh, other, uh, you could go down, uh, uh, look up the, the start. I can't, remember, uh, I can't remember the name exactly. I've been reading so much uh, history of, uh, at the founding. But Massachusetts, when it was started, uh, I believe it was started as a, a Puritan colony, and they wanted, they wanted church membership. And we talked about this just a little bit. Uh, they wanted a state membership. Okay, and uh, so, and, and that's part of infant, bapti- infant baptism you brought in, and you were registered with the state, all right? And Baptists didn't, they didn't like that, and so that created a problem, and even you can, you can track Shubal Stearns and some of these others that went down to uh, North and South Carolina, all right? You can find some of this Baptist history, and Baptists were the ones that basically uh, we trumpeted this idea of church freedom and religious freedom. All right, America, America is so unique. All right, that's why it irritates me when they say, look at Europe, or they say, look at all this. I don't really care about those countries. I don't really care. They don't understand church freedom. They don't understand religious freedom. Well, you know why? Look at their history. They were killing us. Basically, if you didn't believe this, and they think it was okay, I still don't, all right, guess what, guess what you cannot find, all right, Steve Brady and Pastor Armacost are much better uh, Baptist historians, but I've been reading tons of it, I read one Baptist historian, and he said this, he said in all of his study of Baptist history, he has yet to find any instance of a Baptist persecuting another religion, as in killing them. All right? I, I've been trying since then. I'm like, all right, I got to find this. Because guess what? It's not in our DNA. It's not in Baptist DNA. It's in Methodist, Presbyterian. Oh, yeah. It's, and, and I'm telling you, it's all over the Catholics. Oh, they'll slice and dice you without thinking. All right, but guess what? It's not in us. In fact, at, uh, during the time of the Revolution, way back in some, you know, in the 17, uh, late 1700s, there's a lot of Baptists that were kind of pacifist, right? All right? I'm, I'm waiting for nods there. There were, there were some pacifists there because as they studied Scripture, they had a hard time. They had a hard time measuring that. And I'm glad they finally picked up the sword because now we can just go and kill people. No, I just, no. But they had a hard time with that. Why? Because... There's this idea of religious freedom and church freedom and soul liberty that we believe in strongly. It's built into a Baptist DNA. And it's very important for us that we, and I believe that we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing this, and I, I'm hoping that we keep doing this. I want this handed down to our children. You know why? It's very important for them to understand it. It's very important for them to understand what has been given to them and and how that the the Baptists, uh, it's okay for us to talk about our differences because, you know, hey, the Lutherans, the Catholics, the Presbyterians, I differ with them, but because of Baptist involvement in the start of our nation, guess what? We believe that they have liberty to do that and I have the liberty to make fun of them. We have the liberty to do this in America. It's different than Europe. It's different than Asia. It's different than anywhere else in the world. So I don't want to be like anybody else. America's different. We have freedom. We have church freedom. Baptists have rejected the practice of some denominations for denominational authorities to hand down to local congregations what to believe and how to worship. Baptists have insisted that there is no human authority over a Baptist church. Only Christ is Lord of a church. Um, So so is there a biblical basis for this? We believe there is a biblical basis for this. Uh, If you turn to Acts chapter 6, I gave you some verses at the beginning, but if you turn to Acts chapter 6, notice this is a church And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglecting, uh, neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them 
and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So what you see is that they came up with this idea of, as we call them now, deacons, or the word is servants. The churches in the New Testament times selected from their own membership persons to care for the physical needs of their members. Uh, we saw already in Acts chapter 13, remember that was a church in Antioch, and they were, the Holy Spirit came and moved, they fasted and prayed together and moved within their body, within their membership, and, and said, hey, give me Saul and Barnabas. And that's what we saw, remember, a year and a half ago. That's why I wanted to have Josh McGee get up and give a testimony, because that's what a church should want. A church should want God visiting among the midst and saying, hey, I want that young man. I want that lady. That's what I want. That's how God works. The Holy Ghost comes in and says, give me that person. That is, that is an honor as a church to have God come and visit like that. And that's what... That's what we see in Scripture. That is a, a scriptural action. You also see that churches were given the, uh, the responsibility of disciplining. And that's never, that's never a, a fun thing to do. But in Matthew 18, we're given some uh, ideas of how to do that. But then also... In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is written to the church at Corinth. So this is one church, one body of believers, there together in Corinth. And notice in chapter 5, Paul says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed, might be taken away from among you. What is he talking about? Discipline. He's talking about church discipline. And so guess what should happen within a, a church takes care of its own discipline. I don't, we don't have to go and uh, write down state. We don't have to, uh, again, write, write the papal order and say, hey, got this problem, what are we supposed to do? We can work on it right here and deal with it. Each of these actions was taken under the lordship of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit without any external direction or control. Spiritual leaders relied on, were relied on to help lead and guide these things. So there's a biblical basis there's a biblical basis for what we're talking about. Church freedom is through Scripture. You see, this is the New Testament idea. The New Testament idea is that we have churches, and it's not, all right? And that's what I have a problem. I have a problem with the Presbyterians, and I have a problem with the Presbyterians, and I have a problem with the Reformed Baptists, because what they have done is they have taken Scripture, and they've mixed it all up. They've, uh, we, in, in theology, we call it allegory. So what they've done, we believe in a literal interpretation of Scripture. Literal. So what Presbyterians and Reforms, they do allegories. So what is an allegory? That's Pilgrim's Progress. What's Pilgrim's Progress? It's the Holy War. You know what an allegory is? It's a, it's a, it's a story. And somehow when you're reading it, you gotta, and you're going to see when you read the Holy War. All right? It's, it's kind of... It's open to interpretation a little bit. All right, when you read Pilgrim's Progress, that's why we took a summer and we taught through it. But it's a, it's a fictional story. I'm sorry, the Bible, I don't, I don't want it. It's not some fictional story. And what happens when you say that it's allegory, when you take scriptures and you make allegories out of it, who, who's the special person that gets to interpret it for us? All right? Oh, that all-wise one. He's the only one. But the Bible, it goes against Scripture. It's not of any private interpretation. So you're saying that's, that's why we're against that. And so what they've done is they take some of the passages and they allegorize them. And then, oh, oh that's, uh, well, the church, the church is different. You know, the, in the Old Testament, um, uh, in, in the New Testament, you have the church replacing Israel. And so the, the parts that are talking about Israel, I mean, it gets so confusing, I don't think even they know, understand it. That's why John Calvin had to come up with his institutes of, 
of religion, and it's like monster volumes, and I'm sure that he's in heaven right now saying, wow, I wish I wouldn't have written that. I know he is. You know why? Because he's wrong. All right? And he's in heaven now, and he's, he's smacking himself. He's like, dog, he's, he's been marching around his match and be like, stink, I shouldn't have written that. Stink, I should. Look at all these, look at all these knuckleheads I led down this road. Yeah, you're wrong. All right? And I wish he'd come down and burn the originals. I just burn them up. Because guess what happens? We start people down really bad paths. So we do have a biblical basis for church autonomy. So our last thing, church freedom applied. So I, I gave us a, a couple ideas under this church freedom. Or is it applied? We have liberty then in our form of government. So I listed out types of church government. All right, there are, there are three basic types of church government. Episcopal. The word Episcopal means bishop. All right, that's simply what it means. So this normally holds the authority in one person's hand, the bishop. All right, so right away, you're thinking, I'm thinking the same thing. It's, it's very Catholic. All right, so you have, you have this bishop, and he holds all the authority. There is a holy aura that sits around the priest or the bishop, and he has a special connection that the rest of the church does not have. So that's Episcopal government. Then you have Presbyterian government. The word Presbyterian means a body of elders. The authority of the church is rested in a small group, often called elders, within the church, and some have mistakenly put this uh, idea as a deacon idea in Baptist churches, and I don't, agree, I don't agree with that. Then you have congregational. Congregational simply means the body of believers. Body. Okay? The congregation, the assembly. So, Baptists traditionally have held to congregational form of government. In this form of church government, the, the authority is vested in the hands of all the members. Now, the Presbyterians um, and the Episcopals, they facetiously, facetiously call congregational government mobocracy. That's what they call it. They call it mobocracy. And part of it is, it is not, and some people look at it and say, wait a minute, congregational, that's different than America. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, we, we have not patterned our church government after America. All right, the, the, the church was going before America. I don't know if you knew that. All right, the church was going before America. America, it, I know America is everything, and you about it, but really, America is not our rule of law for how we run church. We can follow, I mean, hey, maybe there's some good, ideas, but really, the Bible is our rule of law. And so, we believe that the congregation, the, the power rests in the people. You say, well, wow, man, that could create, that's what they say. That could be mobocracy. It can be. It can be. All right, are there churches? Do you know bad churches? Bad Baptist churches? Yeah. Then believe it. <laughs> go to a good one. That's what you do. You leave it and go to a good one. All right, because as a church, that's what we believe. Now, the, is it taking away? Is it taking away from the authority of the pastor? I don't think so. It's just like as a church. Guess what a church is made up of? Families. So can, can a, a pastor and families work together within a church? Yes. We can work together. Why? Because what some people forget is that a church, who is the head? Christ. It's not the pastor, it's Christ. The pastor is an under-shepherd. So don't forget that Christ is involved in the church. If we get Christ out of the church, then that's when we're going to have a problem. That's when there's a problem. And there are times when guess what happens? In a church, Christ gets set aside, and then it's the pastor, it's the people, and well, wait a minute, where's Christ at? And that's what we have to remember as a church. It's congregational, but it's Christ. That's what we're surrounded. We're surrounding Christ. He's our head. So a congregational type, um, we, 
uh, we have a, a somewhat modified uh, through our Constitution, which all of us have kind of read as much as the U.S. Constitution. All right, but the, but the Constitution, what we do is we allow freedom to different folks. Like, for instance, in the area of finances, uh, our, our, our pastors, and then different people that head up different things in our Constitution, we allow them freedom to make decisions. Now, why is that? Because uh, we, we kind of we introduce that idea of soul freedom in there, too. So in the area of finances, our, uh, the guy that heads up the finances doesn't have to come to the church every time he has to pay NIFSCO. Like, can we vote on paying the NIFSCO bill again? Well, it's ridiculous. So there are, there are things that we've kind of modified a little bit to help out, and that's with as a congregation, and we talk it through, and we work on it. Why? Because that's what a congregational-type government does. And that's why even, what am I asking you to do? I met with our parents last week, asked them to start praying about it. I met with the deacons and the staff uh, many weeks ago, probably over a month ago, and uh, I had them start uh, really months and months ago praying about this idea of Pastor Smith coming down, and guess what we're going to do? We're going to have a ballot vote next week. And what did I ask you to do? Pray about it. Don't be like, some of you, as soon as you, <laughs> all right? And you know what? You forgot somebody. Christ, that's what you forgot. Because your attitude in your flesh needs to be set aside. What I'm asking you to do is get on your knees and pray. That's what we've been doing. And we've been doing that for months. And so when we as a church move away from the flesh and we circle around Christ, guess what happens? The Bible gives us a promise. The gates of hell can't prevail. Because guess whose church it is? It's Christ. It's his church. And that's why there, is a, there can be a boldness. And, and yeah, I'm a little prejudiced. And I'm, you know what? I, I am prejudiced as a Baptist. I grew up as a Baptist. That's what I know. And as I've studied it more, and it, it's not a, a pride, I think, you know, I said this in, under Bible freedom. We need to be very careful. All right, we don't have a Baptist Bible. All right, no. It's his holy word. But I believe, and I believe over time, and I think that's why God led even America. I think under America, what we've, what we've seen is more of an understanding of true freedom than this world has experienced in millennia. And you know why? Because of this right here, the freedom of this. And then soul freedom came in. And then church freedom came in. And then religious freedom came in. And then guess what started happening 50 years ago? This gets set aside. And now all of a sudden, who... Well, you're seeing this. You're seeing, you're seeing dictators and czars and Caesars taking over states and cities. Why? Well, somebody has to make a decision. Somebody's going to. Somebody's going to make a call. And one author said this. I thought it was truly uh, just a, a well-said statement. It was said that power without biblical character, is dangerous. And that's what we're seeing. Even, and so that's why, one of your prayers for your pastor, because guess what, a, a pastor is given authority. That's, that's in scripture. Pastor's given authority. But you know what, if, if it's not aligned with biblical character, it's dangerous, it can be deadly. So you should be praying, God, make sure our pastor is in the, in the book. In the book often. In the book a lot. Why? Because this has a way of purifying. Purifying power. Because all of us like it. You know it. Oh, uh, yeah, some of you seventh graders and, yeah, some of you senior, the new seniors. The new seniors. Oh, you know, and it, it, this happened when I was in high school. 
I can remember when I was in seventh grade and eighth grade, man, I got like royally hammered. And then in ninth grade, we got just toasted. And then we're like, we're not doing that. Oh, you know what happened when we became seniors? Oh. <laughs> oh, we wanted to torture everybody. In fact, I can remember a Doc, Doc Thompson coming in and he ripped our faces off, which he was wrong. I mean, completely, because I know our hearts. I mean, our hearts obviously were right. But, I mean, he <laughs> ripped us up and down, threatened to, I mean, and I'm telling you, when he walked in, you were scared. It was like, it was like John Wayne in the flesh coming in, and his boy, everything, you were just like, I mean, you thought he was going to spin and shoot you right then. And we were, we were terrorizing eighth graders, ninth graders, I don't know, parents, everything. And it's like, who do you think you are? Because you know what happens? That's what power, that's what authority, it happens to every one of us. So the church has a form of government. All right, then the church's application of ordinances. We have baptism, we have the Lord's Supper. And we try to, we try to you're going to see baptism tonight, and we believe, and that's uh, for a local church. Now, we don't have time to get into it. Um, there, there is, uh, what do we call that, um, alien immersion. All right, there's all kinds of different ideas that are out there. There's in communion, you have open communion, you have closed communion, you have close communion. You have all kinds of different ideas. But guess what? As a church, right here, we're allowed to decide what we want to do. All right? And, and again, it's that soul freedom. Another church practices closed communion. I don't have a problem with that. I have no problem. I don't. I have some really good friends that practice closed communion. I have no problem with it. All right? And so, because as a church, they can practice that. So we have the application of ordinances. The, the church's form of worship and order of services. Most churches uh, have a similar order of service with prayer, congregational preaching, different things. And I think we should, um, we should try to be conservative. We shouldn't follow the world and different things like that. And I think we can preach against that. We can preach against worldly trends. And I think that's right. Why? Because we, we, we need a pure church. We need a holy church because it's his church. However, church freedom allows that each church can determine its specific order of service. All right, we change it up once in a while. Like, oh, oh. I mean, they had prayer at the end. And then they, they didn't even have an offering. Now that's scary. Right there, I don't know. Something might be wrong then. But we are free to organize our time of services. Many years ago, this was, I think, in the 60s and 70s, there was a Baptist pope uh, that came on the scene, and he basically determined that evening service had to be at 7 p.m. And guess what all Baptist churches did? 7 p.m. I'm glad if you'd have known Roy Thompson, Roy Thompson, I, I never knew anything, but we, we always had 6 p.m. All right, now I know why, all right? But, but really, I, I know of some churches, all right, Baptist churches, they have one service in the morning, and that's it. All right, and, and guess what? Right here, some of you, hypocrites. All right, now guess what? In Scripture, Sunday is the Lord's Day. I understand that. But does it, give me a Scripture where it says 10 a.m., Sunday school, 11 p.m. main service, 6 p.m. or 5.30 evening service. You're not going to find it. So be careful of being little Pharisee. All right, guess where it's not listed at all? A midweek service. But we've done that. That's what we've done. We've bound together and, and we say, hey, this is good. And, and part of it is because we've, we feel that more church is good. Maybe we're more sinners. All right, we need it. But be careful. All right, well, now, no church, guess what? That's probably pretty bad. We should meet together. Now, in the book of Acts, we go to the book of Acts and we study it. We go to Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, 
And you know what you find a lot, especially in the book of Acts, they were daily in Scripture. So, so I guess we should have church every day. You're like, well, I have to work. <laughs> Quit. All right. All right, so guess what? There's a, there's a balance there. And so, so as a church, though, church freedom is that we can decide. Now, I have a problem when a church has nothing on Sunday. I have a big problem. All right? I even have a problem with mission. I know a couple of missionaries, and they do not have church on Sunday, and they say, well, our people and this and this and that. I'm sorry. I believe Sunday is the Lord's day. So I have a problem. And I say you teach your people biblically Sunday is the Lord's day. I don't care if you got to have it at 5 a.m. Why? Because it is the Lord's day. That's what, I'm not, I am not, remember we said the, the, the Seventh-day Baptist? I, I am not a Seventh-day Baptist. All right? I believe that our worship day is Sunday. Yes, and part of it is because I'm not reformed. All right? We're not replacing Israel. All right? I don't have to go back to those things. And Jesus rose on the first day of the week, so we celebrate every Sunday resurrection. That's what we celebrate. Every Sunday when we come to church, we can think about that. Christ arose this day. And so we come together to worship him. So we have the liberty to do that. All right, then the church's outreach. Biblically, we have a command to reach the world as a church we have that responsibility. So as a church, then we pray and consider different things. So what is the Great Commission? We're supposed to go into all the world. We're supposed to preach the gospel. That idea of preaching is not preachers. It's us being what? Soul winners. So as a church, we organize soul winning. Why do we do that? Because as a church, it is our responsibility collectively to fulfill the Great Commission. So we have to go soul winning. So we teach on it. We preach on it. We have organized times. And as a member, you should be involved in soul winning. You should be giving the gospel out. Then it says, and it gives us a breakdown. It says in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the world. So as a church, we're involved in soul winning. That's locally. We have the ministries. We have nursing homes we, and the jail ministry. Uh, we have all kinds, Bible clubs. We have all kinds of things that we're trying to give the gospel out in our community. But then we love supporting church plants. So Pastor Lewis, guess what we did? We helped support him, didn't we? Right now, I know we're supporting um, uh, Dan Betrell down in Louisville. All right, we supported John Smith for a long time. Uh, we supported Steve Boots out in Virginia. Because as a church, I believe our other job is Judea and Samaria. That's a little more out, and that's church plants. We want, to, we want churches started. And another way we fulfill that is, guess what? A Bible college. So think of it. From the Bible college, and now names are starting to come into your head. All kinds of pastors. You see, as a church, we came together, we bound together, and we have freedom to say, all right, so how, God, can we fulfill this? One of the ways was a Bible college. And now we're asking, and we, we voted on it. That's why, again, we wanted to vote on a seminary. Because remember, I tried to explain to you what we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach that Samaria and train other pastors, 25 to 55, and try to strengthen them. Why? Because the Bible has to be spread. we gotta, we got to uplift this kingdom. So as a church, that's what we do. And then we support foreign missions. So that's church freedom. Although challenges are associated with church autonomy, it's a basic biblical concept. It's vital to Baptist identity, and it's worth preserving and strengthening. Each church, one man put it this way, is forever free and independent of any and every ecclesiastical power formed by men on earth, each being the free household of Christ. That was the Bill of Inalienable Rights, Article 1 of the Union Baptist Association, October 8, 1840. We have a heritage, a strong heritage. 
And the heritage is not just Bible freedom, it's soul freedom, and it's church freedom.